Um, so it is really a great honor to introduce uh, Dr. Megan Miller. Um, she joined the Angelman community about two years ago, which was her first gala. And um, she comes to us from Roche. She um, is um, the project leader in discovery for neurodevelopmental and neuromuscular disorders at Roche in the rare disease division. So she's really been very much involved in the Angelman syndrome project that Roche has been uh, working on, investigating, and um, navigating. So she's here today to talk to us a little bit about Roche and um, what they are doing in terms of biomarkers and outcome measures in a disease concept model. Uh, so we're very honored and excited to have her here. She's really become one of the members of our community, and we love seeing her pretty little face. So um, once this gets going, Megan is going to have a lot to share with us today. Okay, so yes, as Allison said, I've been uh, participating in Angelman Syndrome events, uh, community events now for about two years, and I, I really have to say that I'm continuously inspired um, and encouraged by the momentum that is in this community and moving, moving projects forward towards therapeutics. I think the, pr the previous three talks really highlight for you um, where the community is going in terms of developing outcome, better outcome measures, biomarkers, and also the global registry is just phenomenal. So today, um, with that in mind, I want to actually talk to you about the momentum that we have going uh, at Roche. And, and I want to address um, both what we, are, we, what we are developing in terms of a therapeutic, um, a putative therapeutic, um, and also talk to you about our efforts, uh, internal efforts, to develop biomarkers and outcome measures, but also how we're doing this in collaboration with the community. So targeting a transformative therapy for Angelman syndrome. The first thing I want to really highlight for you is that at Roche, we're really focused, when possible, at finding disease-modifying therapeutic approaches for rare diseases. This is highly important to us for, from two aspects. First of all, in rare diseases, we actually have the advantage very often that we have a very much clearer understanding of the underlying biological uh, reasons for the manifestation of the disease. And this comes out of the, um, the fact that most of these diseases come from a genetic background, and we can better understand the, from, from the genetics what the molecular biology is that is, that is conferring the disease. Secondly, given the fact that most rare diseases are very severe in nature, it is quite important for us to think about how we can be transformative in the lives of both the patients and the caregivers. And in this case, it's very often just small incremental changes may not be enough to really have a substantial impact on the lives of both patients and caregivers. I think intuitively we think about therapeutics as modifying the clinical manifestations of the disease, and that's of course where we, we initially focus our, most of our attention into understanding which of the clinical manifestations we will be able to address. I think you will all agree that in Angelman syndrome there are, there are a plethora of symptoms that, that come from having this, this disease, and, there, and from this we understand that there are certain domains that may be more impactful on the lives of, of the patients and caregivers than others. And that's the point of my second um, part of the slide here, is that when we think about the disease, we want to have a holistic view of both the clinical manifestations of the disease and how we can be transformative in that area, but also how we can have a transformative and impactful effect on the, the daily quality of life of the, of the child, of the patient, as well as the quality of life of the, of the families, which are highly impacted as well. So again, with Angelman syndrome being a rare disease, we are in the very fortunate position that we have a, a very good understanding of the underlying uh, pathophysiology that is taking place. And this has allowed us to, uh, to think about how to approach this disease with a targeted therapeutic approach. And I want to just present to you, um, hopefully so that you can understand a bit more about the biology. I think Terry Joe did a wonderful job this morning at already kind of setting the stage for that. But again, in, in humans, we all have two, gene, or two alleles of the gene UB3A. And in Angelman, 
we're very confident that the predominant cause of the underlying um, Disease, the underlying cause of the disease is the full loss of function of this gene called UBE3A, which is lost in its entirety in neurons due to what we call an imprinting um, effect. And this imprinting effect is actually found in all humans, as Terry just described. And it, it, it means that with the imprinting, we have a silencing of the paternal allele of UBE3A which normally would express a functional UBE3A protein. Now, in Angelman patients, because they have lost their maternal UBE3 protein, we can think about bringing back that paternal UBE3 protein to, to basically replace the loss of the maternal UBE3A protein. And the approach that we are taking at Roche is to do this through an LNA antisense oligonucleotide. And this is a small sequence of nucleotides which specifically recognizes this imprinting mechanism, this long non-coding RNA, which is, which is silencing the paternal UB3A gene. And through this recognition of the long non-coding RNA, we lead, this leads to the degradation of that silencing mechanism and allows for the re-expression of the paternal UB3A um, copy. I want to highlight first um, how this project began, because it, really, it actually began with your children. We used, at the beginning, for screening of molecules, we used, uh, we used cells from your, from your children, from patients with Angelman syndrome, either skin cells or blood cells. And with these cells, we can put these cells and grow them in a dish and convert them into what we call a pluripotent stem cell. And from that point, we can then differentiate them into neurons, into functional neurons, and use these neurons, which are sitting in a dish, to then screen for molecules, which allow us to see the downregulation of the, the antisense, the long non-coding RNA that is suppressing the UB3A protein transcription and translation, and then the upregulation of the paternal UB3A RNA and eventually the protein. And what you see here in these charts on the lower right are dose range uh, curves, which allow us to, see, I don't have a pointer, but the first two on the left there are showing the first the down regulation of the antisense RNA, the, long, the imprinting mechanism, and below that, the up regulation of the sense RNA. And right in the middle there, what you see is that with sufficient levels of our LNA, we can get an up regulation of the UB3A protein to the, the typical, the, the levels of a typical uh, cell, which is shown in red. Thank you. Yeah, I think we're good for now. Perfect. <laughs> yeah, so shown in the, in the middle here. Um, so this red mark is really the, the normal expression levels of UB3A. And you can see that with one of our molecules at the right dose, we can, we can really rescue this, uh, this level. Now, this is just the start of identifying a candidate model, molecule to bring into the clinic. We then have to move forward, and this can take quite some time, sometimes even years, to characterize these candidate mo molecules in additional cellular assays as well as in vivo in animal models to demonstrate that these molecules are, are safe, uh, safe in animal models, that they are potent in a holistic setting of an animal mo model, and that they are able to actually reach the target that we are aiming for. And in that case, this is the brain. So we need to make sure that this molecule will distribute to the brain in order to have its pharmacological effect. So this can take some time. But in, during that time, there are additional things that we can front load to be better prepared to enter into the clinic with our lead clinical molecule. And that, that is uh, the next two concepts on this slide, which you've heard a lot about today. And that's the development of human biomarkers and, and uh, clinical outcome measures. Human biomarkers are very important in order to, for us to be able to understand when we bring this molecule into the patient in the clinical setting, that this molecule is actually distributing appropriately and is, is acting as we expect it to act and having a molecular effect. And this is often much earlier than, when we, can, than we can detect a clinical um, effect. And it's very important that we have that sign early on. 
And so there's a lot of work on our side, but also within the community towards bringing, um, identifying biomarkers that can be used for this, from this respect. And really, the, at the end of the day, uh, in a clinical trial, what we really need to, to know is how are we going to measure a clinical effect of our compound. And this is what we call clinical outcome measures or endpoints. And there, there's a lot, again, a lot of efforts there, um, both internally at Roche, but also with the community. And um, what I just am highlighting here on the right is that all of these components are really taking the, the collaborative work of, of the patient organizations, of the clinicians, the scientists, the industry, eventually the regulatory authorities, um, to bring this uh, to its fruition. And the ABOM has, has really um, been a, a crucial part of this all, uh, along the way. So I, I want to just uh, talk briefly now about the biomarkers and clinical outcome components and what we are focusing our efforts on. So from the biomarker perspective, we're looking essentially into two domains. Um, and those are the identification of molecular markers. Um, most likely, this is going to be in the CSF. Uh, as you heard about earlier. Uh, you can also look in, in blood, in urine, in, tissue, in other tissue samples that, that you can uh, easily collect, but uh, we, we strongly believe that the most likely uh, compartment that we will identify these markers that will show um, or will show us the, the upregulation of the UV3A protein in the brain is in the CSF. And we can use animal models to start to understand this, and that's ongoing in the community. Um, and this, this gives us a predictive uh, analysis of what markers might be available from the CSF. But at the end of the day, the most conclusive evidence is going to come from human samples. And I think um, Terry Joe also very nicely um, made, a, made a good pitch for why, why this is such an important thing to uh, contribute to it and, and participate in um, as we start to move forward with this potential biomarker avenue. The second area is um, to try and offer us a more holistic view of what the brain activity is uh, after the, the administration of a molecule. And this is around the use of EEG, which gives us some sense of how the brain is functioning. Now, this is not a new idea. There is a lot of precedent already for EEG in the Angelman population. We know very well from previous studies, uh, most importantly the natural history study, that Angelman patients have a very characteristic EEG pattern. It's actually very visible by eye, even to someone like myself who's not trained to, to read an EEG, can, can look at an EEG and identify it as an, as an Angelman patient. However, we have to be a bit more granular about our analysis of this EEG. And in fact, the EEG is, is most notably um, quantified and characterized by this increase in what we call a delta ry rhythm. And you can see that here on the left. This is uh, from a publication from Ben Philpott's lab where they looked both at the, nat the data coming from the natural history as well as from the mouse model, the Angelman syndrome mouse model, which is shown on the right. And this increased peak, which you see in red is the Angelman, both in the, in the human on the left and in the mouse on the right. This, human, there, this increased uh, peak at the delta um, rhythm, it's of interest to us because we want to know, does this, with an intervention, will we see a shift in this peak? And will that eventually mean something clinically? And so actually it's quite nice that this is translatable into the animal model because we can now go into animal models and test our molecules to see whether or not that hypothesis holds true. At the same time, I just wanted to point out that internally at Roche, we have also um, gotten access to the, the EEG data from the natural history study. And shown here is again the same um, the same analysis uh, in red is the, the Angelman patients, in black are the neuro, are neurotypical controls. And again, the most pronounced effect here you see is this increased delta rhythm. Looking more, uh, more, with more granularity at the population to try and stratify whether or not there, there are differences within Angelman patients, potentially by age or genotype, what we see here below on the left 
is that when we look by age, while as, as Angelman uh, children age over time, they, they do see a decrease in this, de in this delta rhythm, as you see by this downward slope, but they always maintain that increased delta um, amplitude compared to the neurotypical controls. But they do have a normal progression of the, of the delta rhythm. If we then separate the, the patient population by genotype, and in this case we, we looked at deletion versus non-deletion, so non-deletion includes the, the point mutations, the imprinting uh, defects, and the UPD defect, we actually so found something quite interesting, and that is in a different frequency range, in the theta frequency range, which is this second black line here, we can actually stratify the population between deletion and non-deletion, and the deletion being the green above and the non-deletion, I believe, actually, no, yeah, the green is the deletion and the non-deletion the blue. And this is interesting for us because as we move forward with this as a potential biomarker, it will inform us about how we need to collect the data and potentially stratify the population with our analysis. Of course, now the, the best thing would be to move forward and try to understand whether or not these changes in the EEG signature, either the delta frequency or the theta frequency, relate to anything on the clinical level. And that, that is ongoing as well. So finally, I just uh, want to really highlight around outcome measures where we're focusing our energy. And that's in, in two areas. Um, the first one being to identify which are the relevant and meaningful outcome measures to assess in, a, in the clinical trial setting. And that has to do with, first, what do we think that are therapeutic, or in the case of other uh, companies, what they would assess what their therapeutic could potentially manifest in terms of a clinical outcome, but also what is meaningful to the families and to the caregivers and to the patients. And that we have our the effort of the disease concept model ongoing, which I'll talk about uh, briefly at the end. The second is we really need to build our toolbox um, around uh, outcome measures. And that means we need to build more robust measurements that will allow us to, to really measure the concepts in a, in a meaningful way uh, for this patient population. And here we're focused on the development of more objective measurements. So, for example, in sleep, an area of, of strong interest for us, we really want to know um, what, in this area, traditionally, uh, most of the data comes from a diary, a sleep diary that is, is kept by the caregiver. We want to know that can we measure the deficits in sleep that are so pronounced in Angelman syndrome using quantitative techniques and potentially techniques that we can use in the home. We also, as you heard just before me, need to identify meaningful caregiver and clinician-based uh, assessments. And I think that I, I really applaud the community efforts here because I think that, as you have seen already, there are there are really um, there is movement forward in this domain. And I think we will get to the point where we have uh, sufficient fit-for-purpose ass assessment strategies for for your children. Um, the third thing is to, um, to see whether or not it would be feasible to use some of these digital devices that are coming onto the market. And these can be very informative for us from, from multiple perspectives, but one being that it allows us for continuous sampling over a, a period of time, which gives us more, more data, but also potentially a more robust uh, readout of the progression of this of the particular symptom that we are assaying. It also has the ability to be potentially much less invasive for the child and for the, for the families. And on that note, I think one thing that is very interestingly uh, being explored and also from our perspective is what can we do in the home setting um, rather than always bringing the, the patient into the clinic, which can be quite stressful. So from this perspective, we have uh, really two areas that we're focusing on. And one, which is an ongoing process right now, and we hope to kick off early next year, 
is that we are, um, we are planning to do a, what we're calling an endpoint enabling study in patients. And this will really address some of these areas that I've listed here in terms of identifying how we can best measure those domains that we think are really critical for, for this patient population. So as we move forward with that in the next year, I really implore you to keep your eye out for this study and, and participate because I think it will be, we think it will be very informative. Um, the second one is, and I talked about this last year so you might be familiar with it already, is the disease concept model. And this is being led by Tom Wilgross uh, at Roche, pictured here, in a very strong collaboration with the ABOM consortia and the community. And its, its purpose is really to help us identify relevant outcome measures for Angelman syndrome. And this slide, I, it's, it's a bit wordy, but I just want to try and highlight why, and how and why we we come up with a, a disease com concept model. And it's really an iterative process which starts with an analysis of what we already know, what's been published in the literature, but then it goes into the next step which is a, a qualitative assessment of caregivers and, and clinicians. And this is where Ro Roche is now focusing their attention and have committed the funding for and into this qualitative uh, interview assessment which might, some of you may have already um, participated in or will participate in in the coming months. And it's really supposed to inform us on some of the more, uh, again, the more salient features that are characteristic of Angelman syndrome. And through this, we will gain further insights and refine this model. The next step is then to go into a quantitative, uh, more global assessment. Um, I should mention that these qualitative assessments uh, are limited in numbers and we're focusing our efforts in the US. However, we are doing some interviews in the Netherlands and in Australia. But this quantitative, more global effort will, will bring in um, quite, quite a few um, more, um, more people into, into the assessment. At the end of the day, this will allow, give us a paper that really um, expresses what is the burden of this disease and will allow us to, um, to identify what uh, clinical assessments are best uh, used to measure these characteristics that, uh, that describe Angelman syndrome. The last slide is to just uh, give you actually a very optimistic or positive example of how this has already been used um, at Roche to identify um, a, an outcome measure that has worked. And, and this is in the population of autism spectrum disorders. And on the left here, you have just the, um, the model of the, of the disease, um, the disease conceptual model at a high level view. But really, when you start to go into the, uh, the details of this model, it allows you to then take the assessments that you think might be, uh, might be relevant to this disorder and see whether or not they actually are going to be measuring the things you need them to measure. And in this case, we were able to identify that for ASD, the violin to uh, adaptive behavior scales would be a sufficient measure for this population. And in fact, in our phase two trials, did show efficacy and clinical significance. And we're using that moving forward as our primary measure in our uh, upcoming trials. So I just want to end with a huge thank you. Um, we know that all of your efforts, your efforts to be here today, your efforts to participate in the trials, to participate in the disease concept model interviews, we know that in the context of your daily lives, this is not a trivial task. Um, and I, I really think that, and I, I'm not the only one, but I, I know that these efforts are, are going to be useful for the future and are going to end up being uh, very meaningful. So, I really thank you for those efforts and, and appreciate all of the time and, and the energy that you have, that you have put into the, to, to those efforts. Thank you. So we're gonna change over speakers and we're gonna skip the break. Um, but one thing I just wanted to make very clear, I think a lot of what Megan just talked about um, was um, probably something that you're all, your eyes are like wide and you're like, what did that all just mean? But what I want you to realize, um, which you may or may not, 
is that Megan just told you there's another gene therapy strategy coming to Angelman syndrome. So I'm about to cry, but I hope you guys realize that was like a really huge statement for our community. So that's number five. So this is amazing, amazing news.